Enter now. Without a doubt, apocalyptic scenarios centered around biblical prophecy are getting quite popular these days. Multi-million dollar films and novels portray a number of possibilities for what we might call the end of the world. It's also true that the supercharged center of these popular end time scenarios swirls around an evil antichrist who claims to be God inside a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem, moving the world to the brink of Armageddon. All this in spite of the fact that today there is no Jewish temple in the Middle East. So is the scenario based on fact or fiction? The answer may surprise you as we continue our investigation of the Antichrist Chronicles. December 7, 1941 is a day that Americans will never forget. This was the tragic day when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. This was the event that launched the United States into the Second World War. It's obvious that this day in American history still lives because the movie Pearl Harbor that was released May 25, 2001 was a box office hit and a lot of people just watched it and relived uh, the horror of that moment. What you're about to see is some actual photographs, some rare pictures of the actual bombing that took place in 1941. There were 353 Japanese planes that swept down upon Pearl Harbor. They came in two waves. When the dust settled, 18 battleships had gone down. 188 planes were destroyed. Approximately 2,400 people lost their lives and about 1,100 more were wounded. This event, as I mentioned, launched the United States into the Second World War, and the cry was raised, remember Pearl Harbor. Now, folks, we're not going to drop any actual bombs during this seminar, obviously, but I want to tell you that we are really, in this meeting, going to talk about a very, very explosive subject and it has to do with the temple, the temple of God, and what the Bible says about the Antichrist entering in to that temple. So if you're ready, I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is the major passage that we've been studying from night to night, from subject to subject in this, in this special program. And right now we're going to get deep, deeper into the waters of this amazing chapter. The Antichrist Chronicles continues, so here we go. And what we should do is we should have a prayer. I always like to pray before we actually read from, from the Bible. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, let's please bow our heads. Hope you don't mind. And let's pray and ask Jesus to help us and bless us during this series. Lord, again, we come to you. This is a special message, a special subject, an explosive one. And we pray that you will pour out your spirit, that you will open hearts here and around the world to what is going to be shared right here from the Bible. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We've been going through this chapter, and let me just review a little bit. This is Paul's greatest chapter that deals specifically with the subject of the Antichrist. In verse 1, Paul wrote, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, Jesus is going to come and he's going to gather us. Amen? And we're looking forward to that. Now then in verse 3, Paul said, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, referring to the day when Jesus comes to pick us up and take us to glory, he said, That day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And we spent a whole meeting on this. And that man of sin, referring to the Antichrist, shall be revealed the son of perdition. And we talked about... The son of perdition, we had a whole meaning on that subject. Now then in verse 4, we want to zero in on the fourth verse. Verse 4, Paul goes on and says, Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Did you see that verse? Now this is the verse that we're going to zero in on like a laser beam in this meeting. The Bible says the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God. Do you see that? Now, what does this mean? That's what we're going to talk about. The current popular opinion on this subject 
is that this temple that the Antichrist is going to sit in is actually a rebuilt temple over in the Middle East in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. Now, right now, all that's there is the Dome of the Rock. But current beliefs teach that there will be a rebuilt Jewish temple on that mountain. And that is where the Antichrist will sit. This is what people are teaching, what people are talking about all around the world. Uh, one of the biggest novels or novel series that has ever been written dealing with Bible prophecy is the Left Behind series. We've talked about this in the seminar as we've been going down through. These books came out first in 1995. Uh, they were written by Tim Lehane and Jerry Jenkins, and they have been translated into many languages, and they are literally being read by Christians around the world, around the world, many languages all over this planet. The movie came out February 2nd, uh, 2001, Left Behind the Movie. This whole series swirls around the subject of the Antichrist. Book three in the series is called Nikolai, referring to this man, Nikolai Carpathia, this fictitious person that is described in the Left Behind series as a perfect or possible example of what the real biblical Antichrist might be like when he comes. It's amazing that book nine of the Left Behind series is called Desecration. And that book is all about Nikolai, or at least the focus of it is Nikolai entering in to the rebuilt Jewish temple on the Temple Mount, supposedly fulfilling 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, and saying that he is God. Notice this uh, picture here on the screen. This is actually taken from the Left Behind website, their official site. And you can see an advertisement on the site. It says, Desecration, which is book number 9, uh, hits stores October 30, 2001. And notice that sentence there. It says, in desecration, Antichrist Nikolai Carpathia enters the temple in Jerusalem and declares himself to be God, leading the world to the brink of Armageddon. Now remember this sentence, because we're going to talk about that. They say again that the temple is the temple of, in Jerusalem, and that supposedly he will, or the real Antichrist will supposedly declare himself to be God. And this is supposedly the fulfillment of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. According to the Left Behind series, the entire ultimate focus of this end time drama, again, is a rebuilt temple over in Israel where the Antichrist will walk in, sit down, and claim that he is God. Now, what we're going to do in this meeting is we are going to take a closer look at that teaching and examine it more carefully. Uh, is 2 Thessalonians 2 really talking about the Middle East? Is it talking about a rebuilt temple? Uh, this is really one of the main reasons why Christians are looking over to the Middle East so often. They're interested in what's happening between the Israelis and the PLO and Arafat and the peace talks because people believe very, very honestly and sincerely that what happens over there is ultimately going to have key significance to the end of the world. So that's why people are watching. Now let's take a closer look at our Bibles and let's find out whether that's really what the Word of God is saying and what kind of lessons that we can learn today from this awesome subject. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. This is where we are in the Antichrist Chronicles, zeroing in on this passage. The Bible says that the Antichrist or this mysterious man of sin, son of perdition, will oppose and will exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits where? Right, it says he will sit in the temple of God. Now, I want, I want to draw your attention to something. And, that, and this is it, that the word temple there in that verse, that word temple really comes from a Greek word. And the original Greek word is naos. You can see it here right on the screen. N-A-O-S. How many Greek scholars have got out there? I don't see too many hands. Well, don't worry. You don't have to be a Greek scholar to understand the Bible. But sometimes a little bit of information like this is helpful. And we'll see this is very helpful as we keep on going. The word for temple is naos. Now, this is a very interesting and important word. Paul wrote this chapter. He wrote that word naos, and he uses that very word in other places in the New Testament. And, and when you really look at them, they shed some light on the meaning 
of what Paul's talking about. So let's just take a look at a couple of scriptures. Uh, keep your finger there in 2 Thessalonians, if you can do two things at once, and turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's just do a little quick Bible study on that word temple, the word naos. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Good to hear those pages turning. Praise the Lord. I love to hear pages turning in the Bible. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2. Paul is here talking to the church. He said he's writing to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now notice he's writing to what? What's he writing to? To the church, right, to God's church, the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, keep your finger there, or actually, just turn the page, and remember that, the church of God. Now, go to chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 Corinthians 3. Now, remember, he's writing to the church. This is very important, we're about to look at. It's an amazing revelation. It's about to take place. In chapter 3, verse 16, Paul is writing to the church, and he said, Know ye not, don't you know, that you are... And then what does he say that you are? Right. Paul said, you are the temple of God. Now, guess what Greek word Paul uses in this verse for temple? Take a guess. Not a hard guess. I'll give you a clue. It starts with an N. N-A-O-S. Right. And the word is naos. It's the same exact word that Paul used in 2 Thessalonians. And here in this passage, Paul is saying that the temple of God is what? He's writing to the church, and he says, you are the temple of God. So the word naos is applied to the church. Now here's another passage. Turn to Ephesians. Ephesians, you have to go, actually it's right after, just two books after Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. And let's look at chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. 19 through 22. Verse 19, Paul is writing to the church, and he says, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and with the household and of the household of God. And you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a what? Into a holy temple in the Lord. So here he's talking about the believers all coming together in Jesus. And he says, you're all growing together into a holy temple in the Lord. Now, folks, take a guess what Greek word Paul uses here for temple. I'll give you a clue. Starts with, a, with an N. Right, naos. Now here again, just like in 1 Corinthians, Paul is applying the temple of God to the church, to the people, the people of Jesus, who are gathered together, who come together, and who have the spirit of the Lord living inside of them. Do you see that? Now this is a very important revelation that every single time that Paul uses the word naos in his letters, don't forget it, every single time without fail, he always applies it, always, to the temple of God, which is the church, never to a rebuilt temple in Israel. That's shocking, but it's true. In the Old Testament, when the temple was there, there were sacrifices, sacrifices that were offered day by day, year by year. Those sacrifices pointed forward to who? They pointed forward to Jesus, right? It's, it's amazing to realize that if you were a Jew living in the Old Testament and you committed a sin, you would have to bring an animal to the temple, put your hand on its head, the priest would give you a knife, you would slit the throat of that animal, and that animal would die instead of you. And that animal represented in the Old Testament Jesus Christ. It represented the gospel. It represented the good news that Christ was ultimately going to come and offer his life for the sins of the whole world, 
for you and for me. So he could put his, his pure white robe of righteousness around us and take away all of our sins. Hallelujah. That's the gospel that's in the Bible. Now think about this. Think about this. When Jesus Christ died himself on the cross, what happened to the sacrifices? They came to an end. They were done. They were over. Now go back to 2 Thessalonians and let me just show you something. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. The Bible says that the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, which we've already shown is the church. Antichrist will come into the church, and the Bible says that temple will be called the temple of God. Now think about this. If the Jewish people ever did rebuild the temple over, in the, over on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and if they ever did start sacrificing once again, what, what would that be saying to God? What would those sacrifices be saying to the Father? It would be saying that they officially don't believe in His Son as the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now think about this. If that temple and those sacrifices ultimately would be a denial of Jesus Christ, then how could it ever be true that a rebuilt temple would be called in the New Testament by Paul the temple of God? Do you see that? It would not be God's temple because the temple would be a denial of his son. It would be a denial of the cross, a denial of the sacrifice, a denial that Jesus came and that the sacrifices came to an end. Are you with me? So that temple could never be called the temple of God. It's a lot more biblical to believe the temple of God is the church. And the Bible says that's where the Antichrist will sit. Now let's keep going. Actually, let's go to the word sit. Let's talk about that. 2 Thessalonians 2.4 says the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God. Now, what does this mean, sit? Does this mean that he's going to literally sit down somewhere? Does that mean he's going to sit on some throne inside a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem? The word sit does not necessarily mean sit down. And that's very obvious. Uh, President George Bush was inaugurated January 20. 2001, he was sworn in as our 43rd president, and at that point, he was seated in office. Correct? Correct. Here's a statement that appeared, that came out in CNN.com not long after his inauguration, February 6, 2001. It says, Bush held a short summit Friday in Mexico with Vincent Fox, who, like Bush, is a newly seated president. So when people are seated in office, it means they're given authority. They're given special authority. And George Bush now has authority as president, but it doesn't mean that he's sitting down all the time. We hope not. We hope he's running the country, not sitting down all the time, right? Here's just a couple of quick quotes. In Ephesians 1, verse 20, it says that when Jesus went to heaven, he was seated at the right hand of God. Mark 16, 19 says he sat down at the right hand of God. Acts 7, 55 says that when Stephen was stoned, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, does that mean that he's standing and sitting down, standing and sitting down all the time? Jesus said in Mark 14, 62, that when he comes in the clouds of glory, he says, he, he told the Jewish leaders, he said, you will see me sitting on the right hand of the power. Now, does that mean that when Jesus comes, he's going to be sitting down when he returns? Obviously not. To be sitting has to do with being seated in authority. And when the Bible says that Antichrist is going to sit in the temple of God. Folks, what this means is, biblically, according to the New Testament, that the Antichrist will sit in a position of supreme authority inside the church of God, an authority that belongs only to Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is talking about. Now, let's keep going. We've got more to do. Let's go back to the text, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. It also says that he would sit as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Left Behind series and the advertisement for the, the I'm sure it's going to be a multi-million dollar best-selling book, Desecration, the advertisement we just read on the website said that, that he would go into the temple and he would declare himself to be God. This is the common interpretation of this passage, is that the Antichrist will walk into a literal rebuilt temple in the Middle East, he will open his mouth, he will sit down, and he will say, I am God. 
Now, folks, is that really what the Bible is saying? Is that really what Paul says? If you look at it carefully, that is not what he says. If you look at this passage, Paul says that he would sit as God, showing himself that he is God. In other words, he's not going to just say it. That would be too obvious. But he's going to show, he's going to reveal this by his claims and his actions. And we'll talk more about this later as we continue on in the Antichrist Chronicles. Here's a quotation from Matthew Henry. Matthew Henry was one of the most famous, actually his Bible commentary is the most famous Bible commentary in all of the world. Ever in Christian history, this book is in, these books are in pastors' libraries all across the country. And this is what Matthew Henry said in his notes on 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. He said, as God was in the temple of old and worshiped there and is in and with his church now, so the Antichrist here mentioned is some usurper of God's authority in the Christian church. You see that? We've got to get that right. Matthew Henry was right. And that's what the Bible says. Let's go back to 2 Thessalonians and let's summarize what we have just looked at. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says, We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together to him. Jesus is going to come and gather us. Verse 3, he said, Let no man deceive you by any means. Christians are in danger of being deceived. And Paul's warning us that that day when Jesus comes will not come except there come a falling away. And we talked about this as a falling away inside the Christian church. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. This happens first before Jesus comes to gather us who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits, there's authority, in the temple of God, which is the church, not a rebuilt Jewish temple, showing himself that he is God. This is what the Bible is telling us, that Antichrist is going to come with authority right into the church, assuming the very authority of God himself. And we'll be talking a lot more about this as we continue on in this special series on the Chronicles. I'd like to close with the focus of Paul, where Paul said, you are the temple of God. And then he said, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Lord wants to come inside of us individually and inside us as a people so that we can be purified and we can be the temple of God. Amen? That's what the Lord wants to do. I heard a story once about a wealthy man that decided to take his daughter out to uh, an art gallery in the D.C. area. His daughter was about five years old. So he took her out and they began, they went to this art gallery and they began to walk up and down the aisles and this man was looking at the pictures and he was explaining them to his daughter and he said, oh dear, look at that. That's a beautiful painting by uh, Italian artist Michelangelo. She went, oh wow, dad, that's great. And then he went, and now that one, that's by Monet, a French impressionist. And that one's by uh, another great artist, uh, Vincent van Gogh. And as they're walking back and forth, this little girl's just looking at all these pictures and she's amazed at her dad's knowledge. And finally, as they went up and down the aisles, they got to a particular painting of Jesus Christ knocking on the door of a house. Have you seen that painting? Jesus knocking on the door. And the little girl said, Daddy, who, who's that? And the father looked up and he said, he said, oh dear, he said, that is a famous painting of Jesus Christ. And she said, well, Dad, what's he doing? And he said, well, look, dear, he's, uh, he's knocking on the door of a house. And the little girl said, well, Dad, what does that mean? And he said, well, I think it means that he's knocking on the door of somebody's heart and he wants to come in. And then the man, you know, moved on to the next picture. He didn't want to stand in front of that picture because he was not a Christian. This man was not a Christian. And the little girl, though, she was captivated by that picture. And she said, Dad, come back here. So the father came back and she said, Dad, she said, why is it that people don't open the door of their hearts and let Jesus come in? And the father, by this time, was starting to sweat a little bit. And he said, oh, I don't know, dear, I guess things get in the way. And, he, and then this little girl, persistent, wasn't she? She said, well, dad, like, what things? And he said, oh, now he's really sweating. He said, oh, I guess uh, things like money, things like friends, bad habits, or sometimes people, you know, sometimes people are just lazy. And then 
Guess what he did? He walked on to the next picture. And he's there, and he's looking at this next picture, and he starts describing this picture. And he says, now, honey, let me tell you about this. And he's going on and on. But lo and behold, his daughter was still right back where she was before. And he looked back, and his little girl was there. And she was staring at the picture of Jesus. And as the father looked over at her, he noticed amazingly that she, she started to cry. This uh, tear started trickling down her cheeks. And the father walked over and he put his arms around his little girl and he said, Honey, he said, why are you crying? And the little girl looked at her dad with only a, a look that a little girl could look. And she said these words. She said, Oh, Daddy. She said, Have you let Jesus come into your heart? And I don't know what that man said, but I know that Jesus wants to come into our hearts, in our temple, and live in our lives, not the spirit of Antichrist. Isn't that right? And may God help us all to be part of the, the temple of God, a holy temple filled with the Lord Jesus and his love. You won't want to miss the next episode of the Antichrist Chronicles as Steve tackles a rather interesting and somewhat unknown subject, the Antichrist and the Restrainer. Thank you for watching. And if you were a criminal, and if you found out that Sherlock Holmes was on your case, then watch out, because he almost never lost a case. He always found his man. Now, what we're going to do in this meeting is we're going to try to be like Sherlock Holmes, and we're going to try to solve a very interesting biblical mystery. And it has to do with the Antichrist.